This is the Low Level Hell Podcast, episode 22. Six, 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 Welcome to the Low Level Hell Podcast, a program that explores the world of rotary and fixed wing combat aviation through the exciting stories of the men and women who experienced it firsthand. Now, here's your host, U.S. Army helicopter pilot, Brian Harris. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show, and we're going to go ahead and call this the season finale of season one. I was trying to get a couple more episodes in, but as I looked at the schedule and the editing process and everything that goes on, it just didn't really make sense. It wasn't going to happen. So I'll go ahead and just uh, call, call it a season here on number 22. And I think you guys are really going to like this episode. And we'll come back strong here probably in October, uh, just kind of getting through some editing. And of course, as uh, many of you know, if you listen to the show, I'll be moving up to uh, New Jersey here in the next uh, week and a half and uh, just kind of getting settled up there. So not going to be able to do too much editing in the near term, so we'll just go ahead and transition now. Give a little context for this episode. I've been sitting on this one for a while, and I wanted to kind of close out the season with it, because honestly, this was something that I wanted to cover from the get-go. Uh, you've heard in previous episodes, we've talked about the sort of birth, the genesis of the OH-58 Delta Kiowa Warrior, and you've heard terms like Operation Prime Chance and Task Force 118 and things like that. So, uh, that's what this episode is about, and I'm pretty excited to share it with you. I learned a lot myself. Uh, Baron's going to join us at the uh, tail end of the show, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about the things that we did learn. But I think you guys are going to enjoy it. This is really where the armed Kiowa warrior came from and, and where it was uh, originated and what it was doing in the Persian Gulf, and I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, Jeffrey Whittington is a retired U.S. Army pilot. He flew OH-58 Delta's and he flew fixed wing, and he's here with us to talk about his experiences. How are you doing today, sir? Doing great. I appreciate you taking the time and, and coming on to talk to us today. Uh, just, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you got involved in aviation. Well, I uh, kind of had a little bit of a background. Uh, my family owned a crop dusting business, so hmm. I, I was pretty close around airplanes growing up, and Army aviation was kind of a a weird thing. I was already flying airplanes, and I uh, was a firefighter in Chesapeake, Virginia, and I was able to fly a little bit on the side related to work, and I encountered a a police officer who flew the police helicopter in Portsmouth, Virginia. And he um, kind of, uh, after we flew a little bit, he said, gosh, you you could probably get the hang of this pretty easy. Why don't you become a helicopter pilot? I... uh, didn't really have wheelbarrows full of money. So I I didn't really think that was too great an idea, but he said, Hey, I can tell you how you can do it for free. And so he told me about army flight training. So that's kind of how I got involved with army flight training. And so we, uh, we did that. And the plan was to stay for just, you know, my obligation and then get out and go back to firefighting or something else. And I guess I messed that up because I stayed 24 years and, and, and then retired. So, but uh, I got the opportunity to fly uh, TH-55s, Hueys, mostly uh, OH-58s in the early days. And uh, uh, kind of more from being an OH-58 pilot into Task Force 118 when it started. And that was really the first time I flew a, a 58D was when that program started up in 87. So mm-hmm. uh, so I did that the, the whole time the Task Force uh, 118 was around and then spent a little bit of time in the 4th and 17th Cav. Uh, then I went and did some fixed wing flying and then back to the uh, Cav again over in Korea. So we fielded the first Kiowa Warriors over in Korea with the 5th of the 17th. And um, after that, uh, came to Fort Rucker, taught here, taught the maintenance test pilot course, and uh, did that a few years. That was uh, a real highlight in my career. I really loved doing that job. Went back to fixed wing flying, uh, this time in Korea, and um, checked a block on that. Came back, did another, uh, I wanted to go pretty much anywhere but Fort Rucker, but I ended up back at Fort Rucker and <laughs> uh, did a little uh, Kiowa Warrior flying at first, but they were so over strength here that I uh, 
a little bit of fixed wing flying and because I, that was under underutilizing me, I, I got the opportunity to be the chief of protocol for about two years hmm. uh, under General Curran, which was a, a pretty good uh, deal. But I, you know, I think mostly what you're interested in is uh, what I did during that roughly four years uh, with Task Force 118. But after I retired, I, I became a DAC, so I'm still flying for the Army. Flying, uh, I did TH-67s and C-12s for, uh, gosh, maybe um, eight years. And then the, the, the program kind of changed a little bit, and we started doing the fixed wing for life thing, or the uh, IEFW, the initial entry fixed wing. Hmm. And that gave me an opportunity to move over uh, my job location to the Dothan Airport. And so I fly the Grobe. Um, G120 TP, the single engine trainer, and the C12 out there. And I, I haven't flown a helicopter in about four years, so I kind of miss that. But um, So that's pretty much my background. I got uh, three boys, uh, all of them grown, two of them in the uh, Army, one in the Reserves, one in the National Guard, and another one about to start back to college to continue his education. Uh, happily married to to my wife for uh, since 1979. So that's after an mm -hmm. army career. That's pretty notable there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. I uh, I sometimes get criticized because people talk about things and then listeners who who aren't part of the military because you know as well as I do that after a while we hear all these acronyms and things and to us you know we immediately translate it. it doesn't you know we don't skip a beat. Right. Um, but just to kind of go through some of the things you talked about, you flew the the TH-50, uh, uh, was it the 5? 55, yes. Yeah, which was the, the earlier trainer uh, before we went to the TH-67, which is basically a Bell 206. And then uh, a DAC, so a Department of Army Civilian. So a lot of the uh, instructor pilots at Fort Rucker are, well, you've got the uh, the actual in-uniform guys, and then you've got the, the DACs, as we call them. Uh, so you're doing that and doing that out on the fixed wing, which has that changed at all with the, cause I didn't even know that, that they had gone to this fixed wing for life stuff, but do they get licensed or uh, certified as, as, you know, private pilot and commercial pilot and all that stuff? They do the uh, initial entry guys uh, and the AQC guys, when they finish, they just take all their uh, training materials, uh, all their documents from the training to the FAA and uh, they'll get commercial instrument. Uh, uh, depends on where you go. Uh, they should get the single and the multi, but some places only give you the multi, but uh, they do pretty well with that. It's a pretty, uh, pretty big step up. Okay. Well, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the task force 118 and we've talked about it on this show before, um, but just I'll kind of, I guess, set up the primer as far as I understand it. Um, so that we had the, the OH 58, uh, Delta, which was uh, just the, the OH-58 with the site on top, the mass-mounted site. And then there was some some shenanigans going on uh, in the Persian Gulf, and, and, and there was basically a push to arm the aircraft and, and be able to do some more attack-type operations with it. And so they, they took these some of these Delta models and, and upgraded them. But, but you were there, so yeah, tell us a little bit about how that all came about. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I, I won't stop talking there, but that that covers it pretty <laughs> well. The uh, shenanigans were uh, they were being handled pretty well by uh, the one sixtieth, mm. and I think the real reason for the OH fifty eight D to become the armed OH fifty eight D was that it could support a precision fire weapon like a Hellfire, and the Little Birds at the time didn't have that capability, and mm. so. Uh, it, you probably would really need to talk to an expert who worked at Bell at the time, but it was a remarkably short period of time that they took to scrap everything onto a, a, a 58 slick and turn it into a, a prime chance warrior or a, a, a you know, those pre-production aircraft. So they made 16 of them and one of them stayed at Bell for testing and it had strain gauges. It was set up for testing. And uh, mm -hmm. the other 15 came to uh, us at Fort Bragg. And so we used those for the, for, you know, all the four years, we ended up losing an aircraft um, in the water over in the Persian Gulf. And uh, we ended up getting that 16th aircraft in with us. So Bell didn't retain any of them, but 
pretty neat aircraft. It was uh, the first uh, intentionally armed helicopter I'd ever flown, so it was pretty neat to be able to shoot a 50 and, and rockets, Hellfire and Stinger uh, off of that platform. And, and at the time when you came over to it, what, what were you flying before you came over? Well, I was actually, uh, I was in the unit that, so the unit formed up at Fort Bragg, and I don't think there was a desire to have it talked about much. The aircraft really didn't fly during the day any. We kept them in the hangar. I know that sounds kind of um, special ops-ish, but uh, that's kind of the way it was back then, is that we didn't want anybody to see the aircraft or know that we had an armed uh, Kiowa, so they were kind of hidden. <clears throat> but I was flying a wh 58 and I was a maintenance officer in Charlie Company, first and one five ninth, and the task force kind of when people referred to it, they always called it Delta Company, first the one five ninth, and that's mm -hmm. how we kind of supported our admin stuff without you know putting a big sign out front that said task force. So uh, <clears throat> I was in Charlie Company and uh, was interested in the program, but I was on orders to go to Germany, and um, when it became clear how the unit would operate, where they would operate, and what the machinery looked like, um, they kind of put an opportunity out there for all of the guys that were in the room that were getting briefed on that. If if you decided at this point, you know, this isn't for you, um, all you got to do is, you know, tell us and step away. And uh, they didn't have but one guy step away. And uh, when that happened, uh, he happened to be a maintenance guy and I was a maintenance guy. And hmm. um, the commander of uh, the 18th aviation brigade commander, uh, Colonel Chin at the time, uh, went looking for a guy who was a good maintenance officer. And I just happened to be standing there and he pulled me off orders to Germany and stuck me in the program. So wow. that's kind of how I got in. It was, uh, I was probably the last guy you know, selected, but, uh, that's, that's how it kind of works. So I really wasn't planning on that. I was planning on going to Germany. I'd already been at Fort Bragg for, uh, I, I think five and a half years at that point. Uh, so I needed to go, but, uh, doing a, you know, a, a special ops aviation assignment is always better than, than the alternative, I think. Sure. So what was that like? I mean, now you get brought into this unit that you, you didn't need too much about and everyone's kind of building it up from the ground floor. I mean, I mean, just talk about how that how that all played out. Yeah, we brought in a bunch of guys from all over. Um, so I knew about half of the guys were from Fort Bragg and I had worked with them before. And a lot of the others were from uh, the test unit for uh, FM 118. Uh, which was at Rucker, and uh, then a, a few more were uh, just high-time goggle guys that had been here at Rucker, and uh, then some guys that uh, I guess just had a background for special ops stuff who weren't busy, and so they put all these guys together, and it was a it was a pretty good mix. I was uh, it's probably the most uh, as a group the most skilled group I've ever been around, and we all had kind of our specialties, but it was. It was a little shocking too. It was the first FAD one unit I'd ever been in. So, uh, if you needed something, you really already had it because uh, the unit was that important to the operations over there. So, I was definitely not accustomed to that. I uh, was told to go see uh, go see Al Hosley, uh, who's one of the guys who was there. He's the Aussie guy, and I'm expecting Al's gonna, you know, tell me where my locker is or something like that. And he gives me a some brand new Anvis six and hmm. uh, this uh, special ops aviation vest. And I mean, it was, everything was laid out for you. So it was pretty apparent to me that I was in a different kind of unit when that happened. So. Right. Uh, and, and Anvis six being the night vision goggles. And, and I mean, we're talking late eighties where that was kind of a rarity. Oh yeah. It was, I mean, I, I had, they came to me in the case. No one had ever, you know, clipped them on to anything. So to have, you know, cutting edge night vision goggles that are all yours, nobody else messes with them. Uh, that was, that was kind of culture shock for me. And right then the training started um, and it was, it was pretty tough. We had to, uh, 
I don't think anybody in the unit was qualified to land on Navy ships at the time. I could be wrong, but I, I think uh, some of us had done it. Uh, during Grenada, I had, I had done it, but I didn't know how to do it. But we uh, went through a program where we were, we learned how to be uh, uh, really good at landing on uh, frigates, destroyers, and mobile sea bases, which we used over in the Gulf, and qualified the same way the Navy guys do, uh, probably with a whole lot more emphasis on the night vision goggles and the tactical stuff. Uh, the survival training, you know, started right away. Uh, that was the hardest thing I did probably during my uh, time with the task force was I kind of, when I signed up, I thought I was going to be their maintenance officer who was the rear area guy. Mm -hmm. And when I, I heard, Hey, no, that's not the deal. You're going to be a mission guy too. So you're going to have to do everything everybody else does. I was excited about it. But I also knew that I was, uh, I had had an accident as a young man where I had uh, drowned and, uh, I survived it. I had a friend pull me out, and but I, I won't breathe them. I uh, didn't have a heartbeat. They kind of brought me back. And uh, so I, I wasn't real excited about water survival, dunker heaves, all of that. So that dunker device where they uh, teach you how to, when you end up in the water in an aircraft to get out of it, um, that was a little scary. Matter of fact, I failed my, uh, my first time. I was sent to Pensacola with a pretty big group. And mm -hmm. it, it just didn't work out. It was obvious to the to the Navy guys there. I was not going to pass that time. But they sent me back, gave me about a month to to kind of get over that. And I did the Dunker Heads, I think, four times after that. So uh, oh. I guess I got over it. But that was the hardest thing was going back and getting over that fear of swimming uh, or the water. I didn't I don't think I ever learned how to swim until that happened. But as a boy, you know, you just end up in the water and you know you can swim. And I. I guess I never could real well, but that accident just took me out of the water until pretty much those the, that day the task force said, hey, you can either swim or, or get out. <laughs> wow. and, and for those who don't know, Dunker is, is a nightmare scenario. I mean, it's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty awful experience, especially if you have some, some water trauma in your, in your history. But, you know, putting you upside down inside of a, a cockpit or uh, – I don't know. I'm sure they did the same stuff back then that they do these days where they blindfold you or, you know, things like that. And it's just not comfortable. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big challenge. They, they, you, you did two uh, dunks where it was uh, simulated to be daylight and those were bad enough because you're in, you know, in a airframe, a mock-up of an airframe that they dunk in a big pool and it goes pretty deep, yeah. but you're in there with other people who are also trying to get out. So it's a bit of a challenge. And then if that wasn't bad enough, then they make you do it two more times with blackout goggles on. So mm. that can be pretty terrifying uh, by itself. Yeah, it's not a good dunker class unless you get kicked in the face by somebody else trying to exit the uh, cockpit. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I experienced that. And it's, it's amazing how underwater some words just sound just like they do if they're said uh, on top of the water. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear a lot of uh, language under there that's... Uh, indicating people are a little bit stressed out. Yeah. They, the, the bubble pops when it reaches the surface and the words come out. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So Dunker. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. I, I remember I, my first duty station was Fort Bragg um, coming out of flight school and going to fly 58s. And, and we were the unit I was going to, which was at the time, first battalion, 82nd, uh, and then reflagged to first squadron, 17th Cav, but they, they had a, a water mission and, and would train to, to land on ships. But unfortunately, by the time I showed up, you know, everything was going on in Iraq. This was 2004. So that kind of fell off the, the plate of, of a requirement. So unfortunately I never got to do it, but it always, everyone I've ever talked to that's landed on ships with helicopters, it's, it sounds like absolute high adventure. We've had a few Navy guys on here, uh, British and, and U S Navy guys talking about landing on ships and it just sounds absolutely nightmare scenario. And then to do it at night, uh, even more insane. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. The, uh, <clears throat> I thought the ships would be the bigger challenge, but once we uh, got over to, uh, the Persian Gulf, we had these two mobile sea bases and that, you know, they're on a four point anchor and they can move them wherever they needed to in the Gulf. And they frequently did. They're mm -hmm. protected with some devices around them, radar, uh, 
deflectors and stuff like that to, to help keep missiles from hitting you. But these things, they don't look that bad. But when you think about an OH-58 was, had a max gross weight of 4,500 pounds, we were sometimes flying our armed aircraft at 55. Right. Uh, matter of fact, most of the time it was above 54. So we're nearly a thousand pounds over the original gross weight of the aircraft. And it's hot in the Persian Gulf, even at night. So it's, yeah. it's a bit of a challenge. And then you would leave the one deck, the um, Wim Brown 7, and it was, um, it was over 50 feet above the level of the water. So you, you, would, you could get off the deck, but pretty much you were dropping a few feet. Hmm. Uh, as soon as you got off there, you just didn't have the power to you know, right. take off like a real powerful aircraft could that didn't have a lot of weapons. Because you were in, in ground effect, and then you come off that deck and you lose that. Yeah, till you, till you went through translational lift. Yeah, you were you were in kind of a sink mode uh, getting off of there. But I don't think we really had uh, any. We never had any incidents getting off of the uh, Wim Brown Seven or back onto it. Normally, coming back onto it, you were you were light because you had burnt all your fuel off, and sometimes yeah. you had um, expended your ammo too. So mm -hmm. uh, that made it a whole lot easier to get back on there. Plus, you could kind of pick the direction you wanted to, to approach the thing at within certain limits. The yeah. deck that we landed on had a hangar right on one end of it. So obviously you can't come in from that direction. A uh, gun yeah. sticking up out of the thing like it was a battleship all over the place. So that was a challenge. So I thought that one was bad. That's the first mobile sea base I went to. <clears throat> and the other one, uh, I just, when I heard about it, it, it was the deck on it was huge and it was pretty much 10 feet above the water, something like that. And it was solid wood. Um, now I heard you had to land under a crane and that sounded like it was maybe a bit of a challenge. And so that's essentially what it was. It had a huge crane. I don't know how high the thing would be when it was uh, not in its perch, but it was probably over a hundred feet and it was in the cradle. Hmm. And so that went over the flight deck that we used down on the lower deck. And then we had a upper deck that uh, had a UH-60. The 160th was our SAR support there for the most mm -hmm. part. And so they had uh, a UH-60 on the bottom deck and then one up on the top. So landing under a crane can be kind of exciting too. Yeah. Gosh, I, I need to get pictures of this. This is, yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, I'll send you some. I, uh, yeah. I can dig some out. Okay. Yeah. I'll put them up on the website. Cause I'm, yeah, I'm very fascinated. I've never heard that. Um, yeah. And landing on something, you know, it's funny how many times I'm sure you have as well landed in a, in a small field somewhere and you're looking at it even from, you know, a hundred feet or something, you're on final and you're like, man, this thing looks tiny. And then you get in there and you look around and you're like, Oh, I could land, you know, three more aircraft in here. And I can I can only imagine just the scale of of coming in on something that even though it is large, this platform, it's in the middle of the Gulf and it's going to just look minuscule with just nothing but water around it for as far as the eye can see. Yeah, it was. Um, I guess what what made it a whole lot more interesting landing on the ships was um, that. If you've seen the deck of a frigate or a destroyer, they're mm. pretty good size. They land UH-60s on them all the time or SH-60s. Yeah. So if they'll accommodate that, they should accommodate a, 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 a warrior pretty easily. But the trick to it is we landed two at once. So we would have the first guy land closest to the hangar pointing across the ship. And then the other guy would come in from the other direction. Oh, so wow. when these aircraft got shut down and the blades were stopped, there's maybe 10 foot between the ends of the blades on that deck. And we're at the edges of the deck. Oh so, my gosh. and you're doing that at night with goggles, pretty much regardless of what the sea state or anything is, if it ever got too challenging, we did have some crews that if you thought you just couldn't pull that off safely, you could land one aircraft, shut it down, fold the blades mm -hmm. and then land the other one and have a little bit more room. Unbelievable. Wow. So every Navy guy I've talked to just went down 
like 10 pegs based on what you just told me. Because not only are you landing two aircraft on the thing, and granted, they're smaller, but I mean, 10 feet between road blades, that's not a lot. And But two, I mean, you're not landing in the direction of the ship. You're landing at it from the side. From the from 90 degrees. Oh. Now, you, you could approach it, but that's how you needed to. You could approach it sure. quartering or from the tail, but that's how you've got to end up. And it's yeah. really hard to not come in mostly from the side to to hit your marks real good. So we yeah. had some marks on the deck that were army only marks. And uh, one of the things a lot of people don't know is that um, if you go to a Navy ship, the Navy runs the flight deck. If you're yeah. a normal operation and they set flight quarters and, and you, you get a, a, an amber deck or a green deck based on the, the status of the deck and you need a, a green deck to take off or land. Mm. And um, the Navy, would set flight quarters and they would have their personnel standing by. But when we did our operations, it was an army deck. They would just give us a green deck and we did everything. They weren't hmm. approving us to land. They, I think what it was is they didn't want to be involved because <laughs> of just how bad it looked to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine they plausible deniability. Well, so I want to go back, uh, because this is great, but I don't want to go too far forward. So let's go back to Fort Bragg before you guys left. I mean, you started training. We talked about that. But what I mean, what were you guys told? Like, how how did this all play out in your minds as far as, OK, what are we doing? Like, we're creating this unit. We've got this new aircraft that no one's ever flown before. We're flying around at night. We're, we're trying to keep it, you know, somewhat secret. Um, I mean, what what were you guys kind of going off of? Well, the uh, 160th had been out there for a pretty good while. So we had access to a few of their guys mm -hmm. and uh, they did some training with us. We had a few guys deploy and fly with them some to see how that mission went out there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's stuff that they had done before. They were just doing it with a, a, a smaller platform machine that didn't have the weapon systems we had. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so we had a pretty good idea of what we were in store for uh, based on those few guys that had had that experience. But uh, yeah, it was still pretty challenging. It was uh, a lot of unknowns with it you, you, until you get out there and do it. We did a lot of training off of Navy ships off the Virginia coast mm -hmm. and uh, down here in, or down in Florida, just south of where I'm at here in Alabama and uh, even off of uh, Mayport off of uh, just north of Jacksonville. So we did a lot of uh, overwater gunnery and a lot of our, all of our, we were all deck qualified and, and very experienced before we went out our first deployment. So, hmm. How much time did you guys have roughly from the time you kind of stood up the unit to the time the guys were going over there actually deploying with the aircraft? You know, I, we started I, probably in late 87. I would say we had maybe six months in 87 to, to get people trained up. And um, my particular job, I was a maintenance test pilot, so I was a maintenance officer, and there were four of us. And I was uh, the last one to deploy because of my uh, uh, challenges with the Dunker Heads. But I still managed to deploy in, gosh, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I think uh, April of 88. So it, it was quick. It was really yeah. quick. Yeah, that's a lot of training you're cramming in there. Yeah, it was, uh, and during our training, it gave us an opportunity to refine the aircraft. We had access to uh, some really good Bell tech reps and engineers that accompanied the aircraft to make sure it would work well. And so we discovered some things that were needed for the aircraft. Uh, and so it got equipped with uh, Loran to assist with the Doppler AHARs because a Doppler just doesn't work over smooth water or e even choppy water. It doesn't work that well. Hmm. The AHARs needed something that we could update off of, and, and the Loran kind of gave us that backup. Um, we put caving ladders on the aircraft and for self-extraction if we had somebody go down and, and we didn't have SAR immediately available. Hmm. Um, some uh, We had a underwater beacon, these acoustical beacons. In case we lose an aircraft, we'd be able to find it uh, under the water. Had some video equipment that was special, and then all of the weapons systems were, uh, were, uh, you know, they were they were all. I wanted to say they're all brand new. They were brand new to that airframe, but actually, our Hellfire system had 
Uh, its origin was when they tried to put Hellfire on the UH-60, so we got all of those boxes. Our rocket control boxes were all off of the Cobra. Uh, the Stinger was uh, off of the OH-58 and adapted to us. And the 50 cal is the same M2 that, gosh, has been in P-51s and prior for, for years. That, that, uh, so, uh, but it was new to putting a gun that big on a, on a Kyra Warrior. Sure. Cause, cause the old, correct me if I'm wrong, the old 58s, if, if they were armed, they were putting mini guns on, right? And they were yes. kind of at yep. a weird angle, like they were angled down or something. <laughs> Yeah, they they didn't articulate. They went out the door and uh, had a terrible uh, um, immediate action steps on it. If if one ever jammed, you were you were in bad shape. But I don't believe I ever. Uh, I had I was in a unit that had alpha models and it had the ability to mount those guns, but we we yeah. never mounted them. Yeah, I want to say my instructor pilot during the instrument phase in flight school, he he flew fifty eights and and he had mentioned that and said that they rarely ever flew with those guns on board. Um, now at this time with the aircraft, it was, it was already a Delta model. So it was already a glass cockpit, right? It was. Yes. Okay. And that was the first glass cockpit aircraft that, that we had in the army. Isn't it? Yeah. I don't, I don't know of anybody who had anything, uh, more modern back then that, you know, that was not secret yeah. or something, but yeah, it was pretty high tech for its, uh, for that for that period, it do, it doesn't look high tech today if we pulled one out, but but during that period of time, everybody had round gauges and and uh, you just didn't see uh, you know digital communications uh, like that and, and hands off uh, operation of stuff. So uh, we had uh, you didn't have to reach up and turn a knob on a radio. We had switches on our collective, which is in your left hand, and the cyclic in your right hand, where we could manipulate what frequencies we were talking on and and switch the weapon systems around and work the uh, mass mounted site which had thermal imagery and tv in it so you could do, do all of those without you know taking your hands off the controls yeah and and i will say that the the ability to change radio frequencies on the 58 was still better than even the echo model apache i can't stand the way they did it they, they need to take a page out of the 58 the way they did some things but um but yeah, that, that that's what's interesting about the fifty eight is during that time, it, you know, you're right. If you look at it in a more modern context, it's not a very advanced aircraft. But you got to go back to to its origins, and there's a lot of a lot of new stuff getting thrown on that thing, and uh, that's pretty interesting. And, and like you said, this weird kind of mixture of new tech and then those old M two fifty cals, which we were still rocking up until gosh, two thousand ten, I want to say around there, yep. two thousand nine. I think is when we started swapping out with the the M three P. Uh, which was a much better gun, much more reliable, or I should say, easier to replace when it broke. Sure, yeah. Because if the M2 broke, that was it. You're just you're just carrying around a broke gun. Um. So what was the gunnery like, though? Because you, you do have this population of guys who, I'm assuming most of you had not really done aerial gunnery in the in the, the at least in the ways that that you would have to in this aircraft. I mean, talk a little bit about that. We had a couple of Vietnam era guys who had done a lot of, who flew gunships in Vietnam, uh, two in particular. And uh, that was the biggest help with the rockets and the gun. Uh, the Hellfire Stinger, you know, they didn't have any experience with that. But having those guys who had done it before, because you can talk, you know, you can take all the classes on uh, aerial ballistics and, and, and how to shoot all you want. But till you get in the helicopter and you do it, some of that stuff just doesn't make it doesn't make any sense. Like, well, why can't I change my power? Why can't I have a pedal input while I'm shooting a rocket? Hmm. Well, you know, once you do it once wrong and you see what happens, you, you know how important it is. So, but we had those guys to tell us that right up front and they had experience fly, firing the, uh, the old, uh, um, gosh, those long rockets, the Mark forties, I guess they were, mm -hmm. uh, whatever those things were. So they had never fired the Hydra 70 rockets which are uh, tons better. Just, uh, uh, it's probably unimaginable how much uh, damage you could have done with those in Vietnam compared to the rockets they had. But hmm. that was a big benefit having them. And um, I, I, um, I actually was a pretty good shooter, even though I was a maintenance guy, because I was able to cheat quite a bit uh, doing this because our deployments as a maintenance guy were longer. 
So uh, mm. if you were uh, if you flew missions every single night, you know you would you were trying to stay on a thirty to forty five day rotation uh, mm. over to the Gulf and the maintenance guys. We were doing ninety uh, at least. So what would happen is a couple of detachments would go through any of the ships or, or mobile sea bases while I'm doing just one rotation. Mm -hmm. So they would get there and they say, gosh, Jeff, you're a maintenance guy. You, you probably never get to shoot, man. And so they prioritize me. <laughs> so <laughs> you're like, yeah, I never do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, man. I, I never get to shoot. So I get to shoot a whole bunch of 50 and a whole bunch <laughs> of rockets, uh, which was in, in, in theater. That was really all we could do. Uh, for training. And uh, so we'd, we'd put uh, targets out on the water or um, uh, saltwater activated sea flares or sometimes the killer tomatoes, which are just a big, great big blown up orange ball that the Navy uses for uh, gunnery uh, target practice. And uh, because of that, I, you know, if a, if a line guy was shooting once, I was probably shooting two and a half times. So I got really good with rockets and uh, and 50 cal, which always kind of baffled them how that would happen. And I, I was just a maintenance guy, but uh, yeah. that's that's how I did it. But we didn't have a firing solution for uh, either system back then. Uh, flying the Kiowa Warrior, you, you you had some things that would tell you where to point the gun. And for us, it was a grease pencil mark on the windshield. And that was really all you had. And uh you just got good with where you put your grease mark on the windshield for your height and where you sat. And you would just rely on that. And if I didn't hit something with the first rocket, the second one's clobbering it. it, it we got that good uh, mm -hmm. with, with the rockets that you could really put one where you wanted to. The, the aircraft, those pylons, they don't articulate. They don't move at all. They're connected solidly to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it's all you and what you do with the controls that, that makes those things hit. But that was a challenge. The, uh, the stinger and hellfire, like, like I said, that was more of just understanding how the uh, interface worked and, and how to get the switches right to make it actually leave the rail. Right. Um, probably the, the strangest sensation we would have there. And I've never flown Apache, so I don't know, maybe they work the same way, but the, uh, prime chance warriors, especially if you took a guy out to fire, to get him to fire a hellfire or two for experience, uh, the first time you'd fire one, you almost always knew it went wrong because you would push the button and it wasn't like a rocket or a bullet. It right. doesn't leave. Yeah. It, it, there's that delay there. So almost everybody is surprised when that hellfire <laughs> <laughs> leaves them the first time. And I just knew, I said, oh, I, you know, I've got two of them and one of them has already failed. And it yeah. didn't left the rail. And uh, every hellfire I ever fired hit exactly what it the laser energy was on so uh terrific missile yeah no that's that's true i remember it's funny i don't remember the first one i ever shot because i was sitting left seat and it was here at fort bragg and you know and i was a brand new kid out of flight school and, and we came in on a saturday because because you know to shoot those things you basically got to shut down the entire the entire base because the safety range safety fan of it is so huge and uh and we shot it and i i didn't think too much of it because i was so i was so nervous about putting the laser on the right spot. And then the next one I shot was in combat and I was sitting right seat and yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I pushed the trigger, nothing happened. And I, I think I started opening my mouth to say something was wrong and then it goes whooshing right off. And I mean, you know, for people who don't know that thing is right next to you. And oh, yeah. I'm assuming you guys weren't flying with doors on either. No, nope. you know, you got a hundred pound missile going however, however fast they go. Right. I mean, close enough that you, if you leaned out, you could probably touch it. Yeah. It's dramatic. Yeah, compared to a stinger, it's a fairly slow missile. But if, if you're mm -hmm. sitting there thinking it failed, you could miss half the flight. Uh, yeah. but, you know, being in that panic mode. But yeah, it's the longest second ever. Um, so, so you guys got to shoot live hellfires and stingers in your train up? We did. We uh, did it off the uh, Virginia coast mostly. And uh, the aircraft was kind of still a prototype. So, a lot of times they, uh, you would have special occasions where they'd do something like, Hey, we think our uh, weapons pylon because they had to fold up so you could fit them into the right. to the hangar bays on the on the uh, on the frigates especially and the destroyers. Mm -hmm. So everything had to fold in and be compact, and it's kind of hard to make something strong that also folds. Yeah. So they kept refining their uh, weapons pylon, and uh, 
every time they did, they would want us to shoot using it to make sure it was steady and it was, it was the right thing and it was the right move. So mm -hmm. I remember on a couple of occasions, they said, well, you need to go to Oceana and you're, you're going to, you know, I hate it. You're going to have to shoot 10 Hellfire, you know, or something like that. It's like, oh gosh, I hate that, you know. <laughs> Because uh, that's like sending a Corvette downrange every time one of those leaves expense-wise. Yeah. But there's really no other way to test a prototype aircraft like that. So mm. we got the ability to shoot a lot of them in training. And uh, you know, after mm. Prime Chance, I think we, we probably fired more uh, in the Gulf War than we did during Prime Chance. But um, mm. in, in, in combat, anyhow. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, firing that missile. And it, it, was, it was a good time. So you mentioned something earlier and I wanted to pick on, um, you were talking about a, a no firing solution. So back then you couldn't use the mass mounted site, uh, to, to aim the rockets and guns at all. Well, um, you know, it has that mode in it where you could yeah. pin, um, uh, you could put a, a track on the target and that'd give you a, kind of a, an indication of where it's at using mm -hmm. the inside in using the cockpit. You'll just see where the site is pointed. Yeah. And uh, then you, cause the other thing is we were usually flying at 30 feet or so. We mm -hmm. almost never got above 50. So it's, um, there was a little bit of concern with, you know, firing it that low that, you know, you definitely need to get up to 50 to make sure the missile got away okay because it does drop a little bit when it leaves but uh yeah it was uh it was a bit of a challenge at that altitude to have more than one thing to look at mm -hmm. you're just no there's no time for error when you're down at that uh one thing we did which is kind of interesting and I, I don't you know if you had a, an overwater mission and your aircraft was equipped the same way you probably adopted this uh from what we used to do but the neat thing about the Kai War is it has a pretty good radar altimeter that has a warning system in it. So we would mm -hmm. set our low bug at 20 feet. Yeah. And if that low bug goes off, it's, it's just, it's like dinging at you. It's a bell and it's a pretty irritating one, but you kind of got in the habit as an overwater guy. Cause the first thing you want to do when that thing goes off is you just say, Hey, you're low and you would act it off. Yeah. But, we never did that. We would let that thing just make all the noise it wanted to because we knew that when it shut up, we were above 20 feet. Mm -hmm. So we kind of used that as, as a way of not having to look inside, but knowing that when that thing went off, we were above 20. I see. So you, you just pick up things like that that are, you know, that's probably a lifesaver for some of the guys having that thing not act off at, at times. So, yeah. Yeah, using the site to shoot was, unless obviously you're shooting a Hellfire, then it makes a lot of sense. But trying to use it for the 50 caliber rockets was very difficult. And I don't know anyone who ever really shot that way. Um, I want to say we had to do it for gunnery. You know, it was one of the one of the engagements you had to do it. And I, I remember using it to, we would do hovering fire and we'd shoot the old uh, MPSM, the multi-purpose ammunition rockets. And I think that was the only time you really had to do it because you were trying to make like a, a three or four K shot from a hover, right. you know, and you're just trying to lob a rocket out there. Um, but other than that, yeah, the grease pencil technique was, was definitely uh, the way to go or, or just, you know, kind of circle of action, you know, just understand what the ground is going to look like while you're, while you're diving and figure out where your rockets and, and 50 are going to go. Cause yeah. they're bore sided a little bit differently too. If I remember correctly, you know, your 50 cal is hitting a little bit higher, I think than your rockets are going to, or, or vice versa. I can't remember which is which. Yeah. Probably another thing that you haven't seen is, uh, we had the ability to do dual 50. We never did cause it was too heavy, but oh, wow. we could, uh, we had mounts for the ammo can on both sides because huh. they just did. And that stopped. Um, I, I guess with the production aircraft, you just didn't have that capability. No. But uh, you could actually get those 50 cals to, you know, converge at whatever range you wanted to, play them with the bore siding. And as I said, it, it was kind of too heavy to do. And uh, another benefit that follow-on guys had was when, what we experienced with the aircraft at first was you would shoot the 50 cal 
And that M2 was modified over the years with a different uh, suppressor. Mm -hmm. uh, but the original flash suppressor we had was um, not all that good. And it, it felt like when you're flying over water, when you shot the thing, that somebody had a wet towel. And every time it fired, they just snapped that towel against your face. It was <laughs> kind of painful to be over there uh, with the thing shooting. But the first few times we did it uh, in our in our gunnery practice and refining the aircraft, where the static ports are on the side of the fuselage, we were blowing those panels out. Hmm. So they would just, they, you would find them in the floor or the, you, they would be cracked. So the, hmm. the, the concussion coming out of that barrel was just tearing those panels up. They were 20,000s back then. And I think before the program ended, you know, you, you probably had 90,000s <laughs> panels in there to hold those uh, um, static uh, static ports because that gun, it, it, it hit hard, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, like somebody slapping you in the ankle, you know, yep. on the thigh when you, when you shot them. Um, yeah, I can't imagine having dual 50s. I, I think, I mean, you're right. We didn't have even the capability Um and I'm I'm trying to remember the things that I was told as a young 58 guy, and I think one of them was mainly, well, we don't do that because there's nowhere to put the ammo can, and it would right. cover the the fuel port Ooh, anyway yep. or something. That's right. So, but but there are heavy. I mean, a 50 cal, you know, you're talking the ammo. I think was, gosh, like 33 pounds for a for a hundred rounds. So you know, you multiply that by by five or ten. You know, if you've got two two guns, so yeah, it gets pretty heavy. Did you guys shoot? Um, for the rockets, were you guys just shooting straight up HE or were you guys having flechettes or a mixture? Yes. So yes to all of that. Uh, we would kind of look at the mission and what was going on. And so normally we would carry, um, in my experience, either three flechettes or three MPSMs and then four HEs. Okay. Because we, we almost always were, um, mission profile was a uh, gun, uh, on the left and then a rocket pod on the right. If we thought there was uh, something uh, really hard out there that would need a hellfire, then we would uh, probably send one aircraft out with a gun rocket and the other one uh, with four hellfire. Oh, wow. And not a lot of gas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what was the threat? I mean, what, what exactly were you guys to do out there. Okay. So, um, it was pretty significant. The, uh, what the, we encountered the same thing. The one sixtieth guys had is the, um, Iranians mostly had, uh, boats out there. So they would use things like Boston whalers and, and arm them up. Hmm. They also had speed boats out there, but most of the time that, wasn't anything we saw unless they were trying something uh, silly. What we most of the time saw was they had utilized the native craft out there. So the, uh, the dowels. So mm -hmm. I don't know how long they are. I would guesstimate maybe 30 foot long. And they kind of look like they did uh, when Jesus was around <laughs> they're, they're In appearance, they don't look much different. Yeah. But the ones that we would encounter that would be of interest to us is instead of seeing a some sort of little diesel or little four cylinder engine on these boats, you would see like a small block Chevy engine, a V8 engine with headers on it. And then mm -hmm. in the thermal imagery, you would pick things up that were hot and electronic equipment. So we started labeling these as super dowels. And um, so you knew they were intelligence gathering uh, vessels and, and almost always they were armed up with something. It was at least rifles and, and RPGs and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that was most of the time what we saw. Uh, you would occasionally hear that, you know, uh, there was the Iranians kept redrawing this line of death. So there was uh, uh we would get in our, our intel, hey, there, if you hook these coordinates together, the Iranians say, if you fly on the other side of that, uh, you're flying over the line of death and 
you won't survive. It'll, it'll be the mother of all battles and it'll be all over. So normally what we would do is uh, our next few missions would zigzag over that line of death or definitely go beyond it just to, to, to push them back and let them know that, you know, they, they don't own that place out there. Yeah. Um, never really encountered any of their frigates. Uh, we were concerned about that because their frigates looked like our frigates, hmm. um, but uh, they weren't really a, a player. Occasionally you would have, especially at the mobile sea bases, you would have uh, a cigarette boat or a, a Boston whale or some sort of faster boat, you know, zoom into our no tack area. So hmm. normally all we'd have to do is uh, do an emergency launch and just run them off. Uh, hmm. If it was at night, during the day, we would leave that up to probably the um, the other assets that we had on those barges. So the, the UH-60s were there for the uh, 160th, and they were normally DAP aircraft, so they were well capable of running somebody off. And we had um, patrol boats out there for the Navy. Uh, we had Marine gunners on all of the mobile sea bases as well, so a lot of uh, specialized weapons out there. Um, stinger detachments. We had Vulcans, Army Vulcans on uh, the sea bases. So uh -huh. we were pretty well armed up. But uh, So we didn't see much threat around those because once you once somebody shoots a Vulcan at you when you're in a little boat, you uh, yeah. normally don't want to come much closer. Yeah. So were, were they, they were just basically messing with shipping and that's what caused all this in the first place? Yeah, they... Um, they were messing with the, uh, well, any tanker they could. So they were messing mm -hmm. with stuff. So the Kuwaiti tankers especially were being reflagged as U.S. And that gave us the opportunity to, to provide the escort for those things. So we would watch over them pretty close. And you never knew when they may want to slip one of those out there, too. Uh, that was not really its intended purpose. So you would have these roll-on, roll-off uh freighter type vehicles that uh, we would look at pretty, pretty carefully. Usually the ships uh, were pretty read into what the, the sea traffic was. Mm. So they had a pretty good idea if we rolled up on a target and we uh, worked that, that target or that, um, that ship of concern that um, they could, let us know pretty quick whether it was a friendly or not. If, if it wasn't, we would, we'd spend some significant time with it. But yeah, a lot of good video from back then. If you saw something suspicious and uh, you needed to do something about it, uh, we had the capability to videotape what we saw, but we didn't have a, the ability to send it to anybody. So mm -hmm. a lot of times you would see something that probably needed to be taken care of or somebody would shoot at you, you know, you would catch that in the site. And uh, just to make sure that that's exactly what happened, a lot of times you'd have to go back to the ship and replay the video for the for the captain on the ship, mm -hmm. who would you know authorize you to you know take action on that target if they shot at you again. Or so what, was there a lot of shooting, or was it a lot of just kind of posturing? I would say uh, I, I may make a lot of guys mad, but my experience out there it was a lot of posturing. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, uh, there was some shooting at us, and then it would go away. Uh, they really couldn't see us. I don't think they had the capability to know where we were. They would just uh, hear us, right. but they really couldn't find us. Um, we had some suspicions, uh, and we kind of changed our operations. I was talking about the AHARs and the Doppler and needing to update our nav system. Well, if you're out over the water, there's... Uh, buoys out in the water that are fixed and they are wonderful to update over. So hmm. I think we got in the habit of doing that. And then uh, some of our intel said that uh, the Iranians knew that that was one of our tactics to make our nav system more accurate. So we were pretty sure that they started uh, putting explosives on those. So then we had to develop different means to update our, oh, wow. our nav. So we quit over flying the buoys and we would use the lamps helicopters, the Navy would uh, pretty much plop a position down and vector us to it, and we would update over it. wasn't quite as good as a buoy, but uh, it yeah. kept it good enough. That's interesting. I never thought about that. I, I've been you know, blessed yeah. in my time period to have GPS, but you're talking about a time period where GPS wasn't, you know, wasn't on everybody's 
uh, equipment list. And so you had to update the aircraft's position uh, periodically so that it kind of understood where it was on the, on the earth. That's right. Yeah. Almost all of our, we didn't have anything uh, GPS wise. Everything was pretty much a passive system that we had too. So mm. it wasn't giving us away. And uh, there was a lot of, um, um, a lot of things looking for you out there. So we kept our mission profile like I said earlier, down to 30 to 50 feet. Wow. And only if we encountered weather would we go higher. And I, I don't think anybody ever wanted to go above 100 feet just because you, yeah. you would get missile lights and stuff. Uh, there, was, there was enough out there trying to light you up. And how, how long was a standard mission uh, flight? Well, um, the Kyle Warrior has an uh, amazing range of uh, maybe two hours. <laughs> so uh, we were flying a little bit heavy. So our, um, we kind of changed uh, over, over the, the time period we were out there. The, the threat level would go up and down. And so if you were on a ship or a mobile sea base and the threat level was high, a lot of times you would fly almost a two-hour patrol before midnight and then probably one after midnight. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you'd sleep all day because you were going to do the same thing the next night. So there weren't any holidays or anything like that. You pretty much did that uh, mission every night the weather allowed. Yeah, I'm just thinking about it from the standpoint of flying that low under goggles over the water. I mean, that's it doesn't take long for that to become pretty exhausting because that's pretty low. And any time flying over water with goggles can be somewhat challenging. It was it was very challenging because... Uh, and you would rotate position around. So the, mm. the left seat guy <clears throat> in the lead aircraft was our AMC and that pilot, you know, they're less stressed because they're just going to the waypoints. Yeah. We would fly formation almost all night. Very rarely would we break our formation because it was so hard to link up out there with uh, the, the sandstorms and the weather, the way it was that low over the water. So, yeah. It really paid big benefits to stay in, in formation with the guy. So you're flying, um, you know, maybe three to five rotor discs most of the night with goggles at 30 mm -hmm. foot. So uh, that that guy flying the second aircraft is is pretty loaded up. Yeah. And did you guys have any infrared strobes on the aircraft? Or is it yeah, we had MVG lights. Out? We did have yeah. MVG lights that were put on there. They weren't on the slick aircraft, but we, we did have those. Those were, and they were selectable in, in uh, intensity as well. So that really helped right. out. But yeah, but at, at a distance, you're right. Those are, those are a little bit harder to pick out than if you had, uh, we, we eventually, I don't remember if we had them from the moment I started flying for the eights, but we had those infrared strobes on top and those, those you could pick out a long ways away. But I think that was after all that was going on. Wow. Yeah. That sounds intense. That's a, like you said, that's a, that's a pretty tough hour and a half, uh, to be flying in those conditions as the trail guy. Yeah, and then and you, then you're coming home and you get the uh, the leisurely task of landing on a ship or a mobile sea base. So yeah, sideways. <laughs> yeah, it, it made for a full night. Yeah, and then and then of course you're living like a a sailor, so it's probably not comfortable. It's cramped. Yeah, well, we really haven't talked about that much, but yeah, when you were on the ships and the flight detachment aboard the mobile sea bases, we most of the time had some maintenance guys extra on the mobile sea bases and the living conditions were much better on the mobile sea bases. Sure. There's not a whole lot of room on ships. So a lot of times the detachment would show up to a frigate or destroyer and you find yourself, you're not all that welcome anyhow, because you probably just cleared out somebody's weight room or their, their card room or something like that to be yeah. your quarters. And, um, and that's where you would stay. And there was 10 guys who so would have four pilots and then six, uh, there in the beginning, we didn't have any enlisted guys. They were uh, our our junior guy was a was an E five. It was all NCOs to get the level of experience that we needed, mm -hmm. and uh, so you, you become a pretty close knit group. Because you imagine with ten guys, it takes everybody to push two aircraft out, unfold the blades, get them cranked yeah. up and ready to go, and then recover them, get them all armed up, and get the sights working. It's it's a challenge. So what was it like? Um as, as, as it got to the end of the, the, the eighties and early nineties, and then you had desert storm, desert shield start kicking off. You, you guys were still operating there, right? We were, um, when it got close to, uh, 
go time for the first Gulf War, we had uh, the opportunity to participate in a mission with the uh, uh, with the British, and it was uh, involved the embassies. So mm-hmm. about half of the uh, task force went land based for a little while, and I was in that half. So we uh, ended up um, staying at uh, King Fod for a little while, uh, hidden there. And then when it became go time for us, for the embassies, we blasted up, uh, and that was when the war kicked off, really. Uh, we were blasting up north and went right into uh, Kuwait International, uh, which turned out to be a pretty long uh, two-night operation to get in there because of some bad weather and, and all the oil well fires and stuff like that. So. We got up there and then got ready with the uh, the uh, British uh, provided some CH forty sevens and some OSS guys and some of their Marines and we had some Marines that uh, were going to be put in those embassies to reliberate our Kuwaiti embass- uh, both Kuwaiti embassies for the U.S. and the and the British. So that was our uh, primary thing there. Uh, later on, you had that highway of death, and we we were involved a little bit with that as well. Oh, well, can you talk about that? Um, yeah, a little bit. It was uh, pretty much a, a done deal by the time uh, we got involved. It's hmm. kind of hard to compete with uh, A-10s for blocking off that road. Yeah. But you had all the bad guys were trying to uh, get out of uh, Kuwait City and, and get back to Iraq. And uh, so whenever whenever that kicked off when they were in those big convoys trying to, to leave and get back to safety, uh, A-10s and different uh, assets were kind of blocking off the road by taking out vehicles at the front of the convoy and at the end kind of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the tactics that we like to employ and then taking out everything in between uh, mm-hmm. as it went along. Uh, encountered some stuff. We, you saw some interesting things where they would, uh, try and get off of the the their main highway that they were trying to get back to Iraq on. And the problem was, I think, as they came in to Kuwait and as they were leaving, they mined both sides of the road. Oh. And so when they needed to escape uh, our guns uh, and the A-10s and anybody else who was out there shooting, uh, the the safest place for them to go was across their own minefield. So yeah. kind of a bad deal, kind of a, a bad thing to see, but, uh, uh, I'm, you know, that hope that was all bad guys. So, yeah, well, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think the other challenge too, and I'm no desert storm historian, but the way I'd always been kind of told too is, you know, again, to go back to what we said earlier, GPS wasn't really, that you know that prevalent and so it wasn't like you could just drive off into the desert anyway because you're bound to get lost you know oh, you kind of had to stick to these highways and stuff to, to get where you're going well that's interesting yeah i didn't i i mean i knew very little about task force 118 but uh to further understand how how much uh how involved it was with desert storm that's that's interesting as well yeah the, the other group of guys were uh out on the ships so roughly half of the unit was out there and by this time, uh, I guess you, you, you know that the, it stopped kind of being Task Force 118, and at some point it was reflagged as the 4th of the 17th Cav. Hmm. And uh, so I think this is at the point we're at, you know, right after that happened. So we're still the same guys, we're the same unit, but now we've been reflagged as a, as a, 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 a Cav squadron. Right. So uh, that's, that's exciting for us, but... Um, the guys that were out over the water still, they had some pretty significant engagements with taking out some ADA assets that the Iranians had that were on uh, uh, oil wells and platforms out there. Hmm. And uh, then we had a significant action where, and I don't know how well known this is, I won't with the group, so I'm not an expert on this, but um, I'm pretty sure that uh, we probably took some of the first prisoners uh, of the war and uh, captured an island out there that was occupied by Iraqis. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to evacuate a, an island with Kiowa warriors or prime chance warriors, but uh, the Navy went and uh, pulled those people off the island. But 
uh, one of our guys, uh, he, uh, he exercised some, some great courage there. And I think ended up with a silver star for that action. So that was, uh, yeah, that's another memorable. one of those stories that you, you learn as a 58 guy and you hear about it, you know, told in, in whispers, like, like a legend. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to get that certainly at some point. Um, yeah, no, that's fascinating. That, that's just, uh, Oh, a wild time to be in that part of the world. A lot of, a lot of stuff going on and then to add the new technology. And, and as you said, now, now it's become a, a an actual squadron. So I guess kind of the the secrets out at that point. We we've, we've recognized that we have this new aircraft and we're we're doing these new things with it. Yeah, it made my job a whole lot easier actually because being a maintenance test pilot, uh, I have to test fly the aircraft. And up until you know when we could start flying it during the day, every test flight on the aircraft was done at night, mm. and uh, that's not normal. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, it's not. Uh, and a lot of times it was over water with goggles at night and, uh, that's, that's really abnormal. So, uh, <laughs> some of the other exciting things is, uh, um, they may be boring to, to some people, but when we first started going over, you had to get into the area somehow. So, uh, we would go into one particular country, um, uh, and leave out from there to get out to the ships mm. and, uh, I don't know how much of this I can talk about, but when we were in this country, normally where we stayed was in a five star hotel. So, hmm. uh, we, we, it, but that was for security and they really weren't trying to pamper us, but we, uh, you know, we had to keep the operations safe. So we stayed in a pretty nice place. So when you were in, in town, in that particular country, you were, you were well taken care of, uh, hmm. and, you would normally uh, come in that way. And then uh, when you were coming off of deployment, you would come in for a couple of days as well to kind of uh, recharge the batteries before you went home. Well, well, thank you for your sacrifice and staying at the five star hotel. Yeah. I, you know, somebody <laughs> had to do it. And uh, right. so they, they had a pool and, 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 and every other amenity and, and uh, flight attendants and, and all of that. So yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we, we had a, we were treated pretty well. Uh, and, and the chain of command, actually, they did their best to, to keep us uh, uh, in good morale. So That's certainly better than the tent cities that we go to now and get sandblasted walking half a mile to get to Chow and another half mile to get to the gym. And Would you say that this was probably the, I don't want to say a highlight, but, but certainly the, the most high adventure part of your aviation career? Yeah, danger and adventure-wise, yeah, this was definitely it. <laughs> it's, uh, I... Um, you know, I ended up with a, a, a few decorations out of it. I have a couple air medals and, and a few MSMs, and, and I'm, I'm proud of those. But uh, actually, something I did uh, after that, just a little bit after uh, I was on my way to Korea, and I went back to flying 58s for a short period of time with a unit that had a bunch of W1s in it because they couldn't get trained because of Desert Storm. They were just kind of left uh, there. Most of them were Schnook pilots, but they made them 58 pilots so they could at least fly something. So they needed mm -hmm. some senior warrants over there. And by that time, uh, well, during all of this time, I was a senior W2. I wasn't uh, the the phenomenal W4 I was when I retired. So I was <laughs> still kind of a young, young kid. And, um, so I got the opportunity to see some stuff that uh, you really don't ever want to see. I, uh, real tragic and, and, and a lot of destruction, but it, Hurricane Andrew hit the, the area south of Miami, mm -hmm. uh, Florida City and, and Homestead, that area. And our unit deployed out of Fort Bragg down there to, to assist. And, and to tell you the truth, that was probably my most rewarding uh, thing I ever did in the Army uh, is because you were, you were there uh, and you were doing things for American people and they needed you. And it yeah. was, it was just, it was awesome to do it. And I, I got the job of uh, flying the local area commander around and uh, even the, the FEMA uh, local guy. And uh, so I got an opportunity to see some things that could help the operation and, and you know, have an effect on it. One thing in particular is uh, if you've ever been to a, a, a disaster site, everybody wants to see it but everybody doesn't really 
mix well with military helicopters and people in the relief effort. So yeah. you would take off from a field site there and it's very hard to navigate in a place that's destroyed too, because you just don't realize how much you use uh, towers and stuff like that, that are laying on the ground, but uh, it right. was kind of hard to navigate around there, but you would take off and you would have other military helicopters, the media out there uh, yeah. in droves. And I just knew we were going to hit some helicopters together. So it gave me an opportunity to do something that uh, I, I really almost got in trouble for. But I, I decided, well, I'm flying the, the general around. I can't get him killed in a helicopter. So I went and bought some shoe polish and I uh, striped my blades. Mm -hmm. So I uh, did the tail rotor, did the main rotor. And then after a few guys saw that, because that's how the civilian helicopters did theirs. Mm. Uh, and they stood out like a sore thumb. And then we started standing out. And then some of the commanders there, they were like, you've ruined my military helicopter. It's not supposed to be visible. You know, I'm like, I uh, got it. Uh, but then they caught on and we started doing it. And I can't help thinking, you know, you can't prove it, but I just knew we were destined to hit some helicopters together. We never had that happen. Uh, and, I, and I think it was because we were so visible there after the first couple of weeks, you know, you could see military helicopters like you could the, uh, the news helicopters. And it was a big benefit, but yeah, yeah I remember watching footage of, of Katrina. We, I was here at, at Fort Bragg when Katrina happened and, and, uh, we sent our alpha troop down there to do the same thing you're talking about. In fact, I almost went with them. I was in Bravo troop. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, the, the congestion, the airspace congestion is out of control. I remember just watching the video of that and just aircraft everywhere. But, um, but yeah, the stripes on the blades, I mean, we did the same thing when I commanded a troop in Afghanistan in 2010, we were doing, um, you know, kind of old school pink teams from Vietnam era. We, we would have an a Apache and a, a Kiowa and, uh, we had the problem with the Apaches just couldn't keep track of us, you know, cause we were down low and zipping around and. And they just weren't used to it. It wasn't that they couldn't do it. They just weren't used to it. And uh, so we did the same thing. We started painting stripes on top of the on top of the blades so they could see us. We kind of joked that we were the flying circus, but but yeah, it works. Yeah, it's uh, well, you didn't paint anything red like uh, Rick Tobin or anything. <laughs> yeah, <so>. no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's it's a safety thing, and it's you, you, yeah. in those situations, it it pays to be seen. I mean, nobody's uh, yeah. You know, you don't worry about the Taliban seeing me from space. Right. You know, <laughs> well, this has been uh, absolutely fascinating, um, you know, to to be a 58 guy coming into the community. You know, you would hear about these stories of the things that that were done in the the prime chance time frame and everything. And it was like I said, it was it was legendary. Um, and and in fact, we even had. Uh, a gentleman that was still in the brigade. I want to say, I think it was, gosh, he was a CW five. You know, when I showed up, uh, had, had been with you guys as well. Uh, Jim Lattimore. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And he was the chief, you know, senior chief of the brigade or, and, and stuff. But, um, just to, to hear those stories kind of talked about and traditions handed down. And then to hear about some of the things that we still did, you know, decades later that, you know, it was kind of a, what's what's old you know if it, what, what is that saying uh the old ways are the best ways type thing and just kind of continue those traditions so it's been uh it's been fascinating to hear some of that stuff firsthand so i really appreciate you taking the time to to talk to us about it and um yeah hopefully we'll get some more of these stories out there uh, about it because it just seems like there was a lot going on yeah that's you may even get somebody who can uh, add some truth to them you know because my memory uh at, at this age, it's not quite as good as it used to be, but, uh, and stories always get better with time, but I, I tried to stick to the truth wherever I could there. Yeah. Yeah. The stories only get better. Well, thank you so much for, um, for sharing them with us. And, uh, yeah, it's just been, it's been fantastic talking to you. I enjoyed it. All right. Well, Baron's going to join us. It's been a while since you've been on the show and, uh, I just have to ask you, what do you think about dual fifties? That sounds like a wet dream that I never realized. <laughs> <laughs> um, having having dual guns on both sides uh, is kind of like uh, something we all wish for, I think, um, for various technical reasons. Um, I don't th I don't think it's practical, um, which he talked about 
in the episode, you know, the ammo can covering up the refuel port and all that. So it would be a huge pain in the butt to have dual gun, dual fifties with that giant ammo can. And we should talk about the, the size of the ammo can too, because that was a double stack basically back in those days. But um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge 50 fan and I know that you love the rockets. So we have a bit of a, uh, um, opinion difference there, but, uh, <laughs> if I, if I could rock dual fifties with, um, API tracer or something like that, man, I'd be a happy camper. Yeah. It was funny. Cause when you mentioned it, you were the very first thought that jumped in my head. I was like, Oh, Baron's going to love this. But, yeah. Um, I, I fell in love with the picture he sent and I posted on social media of the two 19 shot rocket pods. Uh, but though he did tell me that, yeah, they were just messing around. That wasn't a real, a real setup, which, which I kind of knew. I mean, there's no way I think the math would not work out on that, but um, yeah, it's still, still yeah, very that's a lot of weight to carry around. I think it's like 600 pounds plus per pod if you got it loaded up with 10 pounders, <laughs> yeah, which which is basically an entire weapons load for the KW. So, um, yeah, because I, I don't remember the rockets weighed what 23 pounds, 23 pounds for a 10 pounder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas for 50 cal, though, it was what 30. 30 100 rounds, rounds is 100. Rough math, 30 pounds. Yeah. 30 pounds for 100 rounds. Yeah, that stuff adds up. So uh, dual 50, sure, I wouldn't I wouldn't turn it down. I think that would be a pretty neat experience, but it doesn't sound like it was practical. So um, to me, it's, it's, it's the amount of trigger time. Like, yeah. you have enough time to get on the trigger, see where the rounds are hitting, adjust, and then lay on it for five, six, eight seconds, whatever, and then do it again, potentially. Whereas seven rockets, like first rockets always off. Second <laughs> rockets like closer. Third rocket may be on target. Now you've got four five and maybe six. Then if you can't shoot all of them in one engagement, so you get to come around for a second engagement and then your first rocket's going to be off again. Then you adjust. So you don't have enough rockets to really hit anything unless you're Casmo and you hit everything on the first shot. Yeah, I mean, you got to get good. Like, you know, it just is what it is. But uh, no, but there's something to be said for more trigger time. And and honestly, that was one of the things I didn't like about going to the M3P. Um, I mean, I hated the 50 cal, the the M2. I just it was always yeah. broke and it was a pain in the ass. But but the one thing people were very excited about the rate of fire, and I was like, yeah, but I can still only carry 500 rounds. And realistically, I'm probably only going to carry 300 rounds. And now that's I'm squirting that away a lot faster. So. Yep. So did he have any pictures of the uh, the extended ammo cans? Like, have you seen those? So it, it's basically a, twice as tall as the ammo can that you and I know, which holds 500 and approximately 500 rounds. So the, double that, and it goes like way up to the engine cowling. No, I don't. I, I don't and, have to look and they the use pictures. those in those days. I think it. I think it holds a thousand rounds. Like. Maybe it was 800. I don't know. It's kind of mythical. Um, and it was sort of prototype. Like, you know, they they used them for a while and said, yeah, this is really heavy. And like, nobody can lift this when it's full of ammo. And you can't get to the top of it because it's sitting up like about a foot from the rotor system. So it's not mm-hmm. a practical thing. But the the tall ammo cans were an actual thing. Hmm. No, I'll have to look no through pictures the pictures that, he sent me. He didn't have any. Yeah, okay. He, he may have, and I just didn't catch it or something. I mean, he sent actually a ton of pictures, but um, yeah, I'll have to look back through. There was, of course, the picture with the rockets. There was a, a couple of pictures of the platforms that they were on, so I'll try to post the, those up uh, on social media so guys can see, because those platforms were pretty small. Um, and he did mention the one that had the giant crane overhead, which was pretty wild. And uh, yeah, so it, it was an interesting time. I mean, what were your takeaways? Because for us, this is sort of the... You know, I think I mentioned in the show, you know, this is kind of legendary time for guys like us. We hear about these things. We we still worked with some of these guys who were sort of legends in the community. I mean, what were your takeaways? So the fact that you were able to score, a, call it a plank holder of Task Force 118 that goes all the way back to the early days of the KW and like, how did this thing come to be? You know, as long as you and I have been around the KW those guys were myth like they were yeah. so tight-lipped and it was just sort of stories we heard and nobody really knew 
where and what was done back in those days because it was a secret program and uh, you know now with the passage of time things have started to come about but to hear the firsthand stories of like how it was back in those days and what they did i mean you know i worked with a couple of the guys that um like dudley carver was an ip that was a mentor of mine when i was teaching at hanchi and stories are that he captured 150 iraqis with a 38 (laughs) pistol when he landed and you know got out and basically held them hostage and they raised their hands and said yeah we surrender back in desert storm days you know those are pretty epic and legendary stories and task force 118 ties right into that stuff so it was pretty cool to to hear yeah i it's funny because going into the interview i didn't i didn't expect all the things that we talked about to be talked about like there was things i learned about it that you know i never really thought about like where he, he talked about um how you know here at bragg that they they weren't allowed to fly around it during the day you know everything was at night and then and then the further later he talked about you know as a maintenance test pilot he had to do all his test flights at night you know and that's that's kind of wild to think about and i never really thought about that in the terms of how secret the organization was and uh and you're right and and you get credit because uh you're honestly the one that introduced me to to jeff anyway but um it's been hard i mean that has been a struggle of mine to get somebody from that unit from that time period to come onto the show and talk about it because it I mean, that to me was the whole reason I started the show. You know what I mean? Like going back to being a young 58 guy and hearing those things and wanting to to capture some of that information. And that was the time period that I was most interested in. Um, so, yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's I awesome. remember the first episode we recorded. We yeah. talk about that very thing, what you just said, like, this is why I want to do it. I want to capture the stories and where did all this come from? Um and these task force 118 stories are never corroborated. Like yeah. it seems like these guys, um, it, it's all stories that you hear secondhand. So, so to have Jeff talk about it firsthand is pretty, pretty great. And to, you know, now, now it's out there forever and the stories are captured, which is, is awesome. So, um, and, the other interesting thing is the stories are wilder than we ever imagined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, some of them are. So, yeah, it's always it's always kind of reality is stranger than truth. Or yeah, that doesn't make sense. Reality is stranger <laughs> than the fiction um, that we imagine. What uh, I mean, what what of those stories to you kind of stood out, or or what are the maybe not stories, but but situations or techniques that they had to, to employ to to do the job. You know, talking about overwater flying back in those days. So thinking about the days when GPS was just, well, number one, it was a secret program that not everybody had access to in those days, right? So um, very, very few aircraft were actually equipped to receive GPS signals. KW was not one of them back in those days. And to fly, to, to talk about flying at 50 feet and below at night, over the Persian Gulf, which the waves in the Persian Gulf are not that big because it's it's part of the ocean, but it, it's a gulf. So there's not like huge sea states or anything. So you don't have waves to look at. It could be glassy smooth on some nights. And I've done some overwater missions um, and I've flown over the desert. And that is scary, man. And to think about the, the night vision technology they had in those days and how how did you, you know, he talked about relying on the radar altimeter. You set the bug at 20 feet and, and yeah. uh, you, when, when the bug went off and said, ding, ding, you're at 20 feet, like that, no kidding, meant something. Uh, in some cases, flying over the desert in those days was the same. Um, a lot of accidents happened in desert storm because there's no contrast. Like you can't see what you're flying over. Um, yeah. Well, it reminds me. The, the Red Desert. I think you and I actually flew together out in the Red Desert doing yeah. uh, dust landings and stuff as we went into Afghanistan. But yeah, it's that sort of same feeling. But I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't care where you are. 50 feet under goggles for several hours and having to fly formation like he described, that's that's going to take its toll on you, you know? It, for sure. Um, formation flying takes, for the lead ship, it's pretty easy because 
Yeah. You're just flying. For everybody that's trying to queue on the lead ship and, you know, three and four and five, if there's that many, like that, it takes a lot of mental energy. So if they're operating in teams and you're trying to keep track of your wingman and you're not fly into the, so spatial, spatial disorientation is a very, very real uh, consideration when you're flying over low contrast areas. So, uh, and, and with first, well, I guess in those days it would have been second gen night vision optics. Um, he mentioned they got Anvis six as a tier one unit. Um, but it was still the 20, I think it was the 20 or 25 millimeter tubes versus the 35 millimeter, millimeter tubes you and I are used to. Like they were smaller, they were not as bright, they were not as good. Um, that's a, that is some serious uh, high blood pressure inducing <laughs> <laughs> activities that you're doing every night. And they did it every night. And you're getting to go shoot stuff, you know, or be shot at. Kind of crazy. Yeah, I think for me, the um, the landing on the ships and how they had to do it, and, and I, I'm pretty sure I said it in the show, you know, just I remember having Doogie on and, and some other uh, naval, you know, type aviators talking about landing on ships with a helicopter at night. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm really impressed. But to hear how they had to land basically sideways and, and fit onto a deck, I'm just I'm blown away by that. And um, yeah, I don't I, I don't blame the Navy for maybe washing their hands of it and saying, Hey, you know, <laughs> this is your show. Yeah. But, uh, uh, that, you know, that wow. was, uh, super interesting to hear like, Hey, when it's army ops, the Navy goes, you know, clap, clap, it's your problem. <laughs> we don't want to be involved with this. So we're going to go back into the ward room and eat pizza. <laughs> Tell us when you're done. No, I thought it was super cool to hear that stuff. And I'm really thankful that, that he uh, was willing to do that. And I'm thankful to you for, for uh, introducing us. And um, yeah, it's just one of those stories I've just been dying to to get out. And uh, I've actually been sitting on this interview now for a couple episodes because I wanted it to be the, the season wrap up because I thought it was just a fantastic uh, examination of that time period. And and really, you know, the origin story of, of the things that you and I did. And it's funny to talk to these guys and to hear, you know, how much really hasn't changed. You know, there's so much that uh, that we still do that, that dates all the way back to what they were doing. Yeah, what's old is new again. And it it's a great tie-in to how you started this whole thing off, which was to capture the stories. Uh, and, it, you know, if you think back to episode one, it was very much related to KW stories and mm -hmm. and this closes the circle so um great interview i really loved hearing the stories from from jeff and his adventures in those days and hearing some of the history uh because it, it kind of answers some questions that i've always had and i consider myself pretty knowledgeable on a lot of the um trivia of the the kyle warrior but there's some things that have always been kind of hidden in in secrecy um, and not, not that anything that was told in the interview was secret, but it was, you know, there's no, you never heard it from the, from the person that lived it. And that's what we got to listen to. So I, I super appreciate, um, you guys doing that. I've had quite a few people reach out to me, you know, people I don't even know and, uh, ask me how I feel about the Afghan situation and the pullout there. And, uh, you know, I really want to set politics aside and. And whether or not you think we should have left or how fast we should have left or should we stay, things like that. You know, I don't really want to get into that too much. Uh, but I will say this. I, I'm concerned about the people who did serve there and it maybe are looking back and kind of questioning their life. And, you know, if, if what they did was worth it or if it was wasted time. And I, I guess all I can say, short answer is no, it wasn't a waste. I, I don't think that at all. Um, you know, frankly, personally, I, I don't see how else this would have ended any other way. So there's really no surprise or shock on my end. Uh, but I don't look back and say that it was a waste of time. I think we saved lives both here and abroad. Uh, you know, if you if you look at this another way and say, well, September 11th happened and we didn't do what we did, well, there probably would have been more attacks. So I think we did the right thing. You know, should we have stayed as long as we did? Should we have done the things that we did while we were there? You know, I, I really can't speak to that. I have my own opinions, but it really doesn't matter. The point is, your presence there was not a waste. Uh, you were doing what you were asked to do, and many, many of you volunteered knowing that you were going to be doing it. So 
I, I hope that no one who served there th- feels that way. And, you know, and if you do, I, I hope that you can find someone to, to help you have some closure with. But that was absolutely, I think, worth it. And uh, if nothing else, you, you've saved lives of the guys to your left and right at some point, I'm sure. The last thing I want to do before we close out this season is thank a few people. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to Kelly for being an amazing friend and helping the show and making the audio sound great. Because quite frankly, when you guys complain about the audio, it's probably because Kelly's on vacation and I'm having to do it myself. And I really don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so big thanks to him. Big thanks to Barrett and Luke. Uh, for all their help when they uh, do come on the show and kind of chats behind the scenes. Uh, thanks to Chase for his help with the social media side of things. Uh, it, of course, to all the Patreon supporters to give that little extra push, because I'll be honest with you, running a podcast, it's not hard, but it is time intensive. You know, you, you sit there for an hour, hour or two with an interview, then you got to listen to it again once, maybe twice more doing the editing uh, you do all the audio stuff, you send it off to Kelly and let him do all the audio stuff. You get it back, you listen to it one more time, make sure everything is straight. So, you know, just it is a time suck. So there are those days where I'm just not motivated, don't want to do it. But, uh, you know, you know, you've got those Patreon supporters who are, who are helping you and kind of relying on you to get it done. So a big thanks to those guys. And of course, uh, a huge thanks to my wife who supports this, who listens to me gripe when I'm griping and listens to me uh talk about things that she's probably not very interested in. And of course lets me disappear for hours to do all those things that I just mentioned. So a big thank you to her. And of course, lastly, a thank to all of you who listen and who leave comments and ratings. Uh, it's always interesting to read the the comments that people leave about the show, particularly from people that uh, know me, but I don't know who they are based on their name on Apple. So uh, that, uh, that means a lot when, when people leave those comments, it makes me feel Feel pretty good here at the uh, you know the twilight of my military career. After 21 years, you start looking back and wondering, you know, what what impact did you have? And uh, you know, I, I like to think that I was uh, at least somewhat inspirational to some, and maybe a role model to some. And I, I certainly had some great relationships with people, so I, I appreciate those comments and, and love seeing them. So thank you for that. If you haven't already, I encourage you, please go check out our YouTube channel. I've started up a separate YouTube channel for this show. It's called the, you guessed it, the Low Level Hell podcast on YouTube. And that's where we'll be posting uh, the older episodes. But also I'm going to do some uh, little clips and extras as we roll into season two and do some uh, online uh, streaming chats with our Patreon supporters and really whoever else kind of shows up. And like I said, we should be back in action in about a month or so. So stay tuned. Uh, in the meantime, you can check out our merchandise store. I'll put a link down in the show notes. We've got shirts and hoodies and mugs and masks and you know just all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in supporting the show uh, through having the logo somewhere, please uh, take a look at that. Well, that's going to wrap it up for us here. Again, all the comments made by guests and hosts do not represent the Department of Defense or any private business. Thanks again for making Season 1 amazing, and I look forward to talking to you all again here real soon for Season 2. Take care.